All right. Welcome to EcoForge. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so joining me today is Courtney Courier. Uh, you are a PhD candidate at Arizona State University. So what, what, what exactly are you working on right now for your research? So I study uh, drylands mm -hmm. and dryland climate change interactions. Ooh. So specifically, um, I'm really interested in what happens when these places that are already pretty dry, uh, what happens when they get drier or what happens when they get flooded with a ton of rain with, that they usually wouldn't receive. Mm -hmm. um, these climate extremes are really interesting to me and in how the plants and soils respond over long periods of time. That's pretty cool. Um, why do you find that interesting? Is there something uh, unique about these places or something important about them? Yeah, so a lot of people don't realize that most of Earth, um, well, not most, but almost half of Earth is considered dry. Mm -hmm. So about 45% of the terrestrial surface, so that's just stuff that is an ocean, is considered dry land. And in the future, uh, we expect over half, maybe 55% to be considered dry. So a lot of people live in these places. A lot of people have to thrive in these places, support families. Um, these places support quite a great deal of biodiversity. I mean, not as high, really? not as, high as a rainforest, of course. It's proportionally a lot lower, but there's a lot of life there. And I think there's misconceptions that deserts are barren, fruitless right. places when actually they are really important. Yeah. Uh, it, it's always surprising to when people come to like here in Arizona with the Sonoran Desert, like there's a lot of uh, plants and wildlife out here. Yeah. The Sonoran Desert is super cool. I think one of my favorite drylands, um, it's unique that it gets two rain seasons. Mm -hmm. So you know that we have those like crazy summer monsoons with haboobs and dust storms and really dramatic thunderstorms. Um, and we also get a nice winter rain. And it's that like confluence of two rainy seasons that creates a really unique uh, flora and fauna that can live here. So we don't have saguaros, those enormous cacti, uh, anywhere else in the world besides here. Uh, so y you were talking about uh, how the climate, how some areas of the dry lands are going to be getting drier, but there's also like a chance of more rain occurring. Can you explain that a little bit more? For sure. So we expect in the future climate to become a little bit more unpredictable. Okay. So we're experiencing right now a lot of unpredictable extreme weather events, which is a, a direct result of climate change. So things like polar vortices, um, hurricanes, flooding events, these are all results of long-term changes in climate pattern. And I could go into that <laughs> surface, like at the surface level, but sure. I don't know how much time you want me to spend on that. Things like if we're heating the earth by a degree or two, it's warming the poles and it changes the movement of air patterns mm -hmm. and starts to warm up other areas um, or cool other areas and change the precipitation patterns. So in places that normally maybe wouldn't get that much rainfall, they're suddenly getting flooded or places that are already pretty dry are getting even drier mm -hmm. than they normally would. Do you think uh, the climate of certain areas are getting reaching more extremes than they typically are? Like if it's a place that's kind of rainy, that it's just going to get more rain or is it a possibility that it could, you know, get less rain or do you know anything? Yeah, for sure. I think it could be both. So this is something that scientists are really trying to figure out is we're seeing both kind of both scenarios happen. And this is where the unpredictability part comes in. Mm -hmm. um, so we generally just say places are getting more variable in their, in their weather patterns. Um, yeah. For example, so in New Mexico, where I work, um, we usually get around 240 millimeters of rain per year. So it's not very much. Um, How much is that? Is this high? <laughs> about <laughs> like a little less than a, a foot. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and those like little rain gauge tube things? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and and that's, that's not very much to begin with. 
<laughs> oh, really? I was thinking that was a lot. <laughs> not really. No, it's 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 not very much. Um, okay. I mean, it's not as dry as like the Sahara is super dry or, you know, the Gobi Desert in China. But it's still not very much. So things that grow there are like grasses, some some shrubby plants. But mm -hmm. the more rainfall you get, um, the bigger your plants can grow. Yeah. So in a place like that, that already doesn't receive very much, um, we're extremely we're experiencing more and more consecutive drought years. So scenarios of like 100 millimeters or half of that. And, mm. it, and that has pretty significant consequences for the grasses that grow there. Um, I mean, plants require water to grow. So <laughs> really, <laughs> when <never> you thought, <laughs> yeah, plants will die when they don't receive enough. Yeah. Uh, so there's been this talk for quite a while that we're in this like really long drought especially here in Arizona is that affecting the area that you're researching as well for sure it's been a, a very dry year okay yeah so well so I've heard that the drought's been going on for like several years has that impacted mm -hmm. things over there definitely so having multiple consecutive dry years can have a negative consequence on the plants um plants are crazy like their rooting systems can access last year's rain. So when it rains, the water will go into the soil. Mm -hmm. And depending how much it rained and the kind of soil you have, that water will drip down deeper into the soil. And sometimes it can stay down there at, at pretty deep depths for a long mm -hmm. time. And some plants have really deep roots that will go down for meters and meters. And those plants can access that water um, at times when it's dry. So mm -hmm. let's say it's a dry year right now, but last year you, they got more rain than normal. Those plants that have deep roots can access whatever water made it down to those depths. Ooh. So plant rooting pattern really matters a lot in this scenario as, as well as how much rain you got. And yeah. The type are, of soil. Are most plants in the dry lands like suited to you know, with deep roots, is that something that's common or not really? No, there's a mixture. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of your grasses will have shallow roots. Um, and that's great for deserts because it doesn't usually rain that much. So the water that the soil gets doesn't usually go very deep. So you want to have you, if I were a plant, I think I would want to be a shallow rooted one, uh, <laughs> because if it's, it doesn't <laughs> rain very much. Yeah. You have a lot of water on the surface and my roots are going to be great for grabbing that up. It's the plants that have super deep roots that do really well um, when we receive a lot of water or when there isn't very much water for consecutive years because they oh. can access sources that are usually unreachable. Oh, okay, so it's kind of like they're good in some s situations and good in others. So Exactly. There's a whole, there's but so many papers about that. <laughs> somewhere in between, they might not do so well. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. And as a result, you kind of get this perfectly, perfect mixture of plants that can coexist. So if some access deep water and some access surface water, they can coexist together in space oh, and time. So they're not using the same water source. Exactly. They don't usually compete. Nature is smart. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. You, you don't really realize uh, that nature kind of sets these balances to, you know, make sure, like, they're called niches, right? Yep. Where these plants or animals will fill this niche where they can get certain resources and everything. Exactly. And they can occupy different niches in time as well. Um, so that's something I study is uh -huh. plants will grow at different times throughout uh, okay. the year. Like the perennial? Yeah. So there's perennial plants that will regrow every year or okay. annual plants that grow that year and then they'll die and they'll sprout out a bunch of seeds and a brand new plant will grow the next mm -hmm. year. And this like temporal niche is something I'm really interested in studying in like the cycle of plant growth. Mm -hmm. So in New Mexico, it rains only, well, it rains all year and it snows a little bit too but most of the rain comes in the summertime. And so the monsoons. Yep, exactly. Okay. They get beautiful monsoons just like here. Nice. And some plants monsoons. will take advantage of the early monsoon rain and grow first. Okay. So things like shrubs that have really deep roots will start to make their leaves early in the season. And that's because they can 
access last year's water, if there is any deep in the soil, and they have a lot of roots, they can kind of suck up whatever comes in early. And once more and more rain starts to arrive later in the season, your shallow rooted grasses will start to get green in like September, August. So this difference in time when the plants grow kind of like relieves the pressure for that competition of water. Oh, huh. Yeah, I never would have thought about that. Yeah. That's really cool. I, uh, yeah, plants are, I, plants are crazy. They're very smart. How are, um, how are people, how do people know this? Like that, like they're using this or how do I put it? Like, how are you finding this information out? Like what's your research for that? That's a great question. So that's what I do is I literally put cameras okay. out in the desert and they take a picture of the plants every single day. And so I can see the exact time and day when the plants start to grow their leaves. Oh. And so you can physically see like, oh, that honey mesquite shrub, which is a super dominant plant, put out all of its leaves way before any of these other plants because we like caught them on candid cam, basically. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, you do you have a you have a time lapse on your website, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you want to try and pull that up? It it's on your home page of the website. Yeah, that's a good one. Is like that something you took? Yep. In yeah. Your research that's pretty cool. I, I liked it. It was um, it's really interesting to see how it like would start to grow and then like it. On the left is a, a shrub. So mm -hmm. this has a, a deep rooting, deep rooting pattern. Um, they tend to green up first. On the right is a nice grass. Oh, here, Kayla, you want to go back? Oh yeah, I think on my website homepage there's a better video that this um this little talk like. Oh well, yeah. Sorry, Kayla. It's um, on our website, CourtneyCourier.com. We have it pulled up. We'll see if it works. Uh, it's yeah. Put it on the right, screen. Right. <laughs> there, there we go. We go. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So on the left here is a shrub, um, and that has a deep rooting pattern. They'll tend to get green first. So this is like winter. All right. Oh, okay. So everything's dying. It's winter. There's a little bit of snow, and then you'll start to see the shrub put out its leaves first. And then the big grass bunch on the right mm -hmm. won't get green until a lot later in the season. Oh, so we see what, it's starting to make green leaves. What time was that? This is about four or five years worth of data. Oh, so I don't know what year that was, um, but okay. grasses start to get green in about end of August, September. This is actually a good clip of that. Is right now. Yeah, you, you can kind of see how it went from like yellow to green, but much later than that shrub did. Yeah, and, uh, I guess the interesting about thing about the desert is, or sorry, draylands too, is that sometimes plants look dead, but they're not actually. Totally. These plants are definitely not dead. They do a lot of things below ground that we can't see and that is pretty hard to measure. Below ground, I got to give mad props and kudos to any scientist that does below ground work because it's very difficult just to digging. measure. Yeah, <laughs> lots of digging holes. Um, I mean, the thing that's beautiful about plants is that you can measure them from space. Wait, what? But we can only look at the above ground part and oh, so from yeah. space and so much happens below ground. That's really hard. Um, yeah, but yeah people, it's a lot of digging holes. <laughs> people forget about the root system. Right. And it's that's especially important, like you were saying, in, in desert plants. Yeah. I... I always think it's interesting um, here in the desert, there'll be washes where there's like no water at the moment, but like all the plants are green and everything. And I think it's usually because there's water under underground, kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah. So these rooting systems can access water um, even if even if it doesn't reach the surface. So like when water reaches the surface, it puddles. Mm -hmm. But there's usually still water in washes deep down maybe like 10, even 10 meters down, which is very deep. Like an underground river, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Yep. Even mesquite, which is what you saw in that video, their roots are so strong that they can break through 
hard there's like hard layers of soil that are deep down oh. that these plants can even break through that and reach deep water hmm. is a mesquite tree a shrub is a mesquite a shrub or a tree that's a great question. And I, you know, we debate, I never know. <laughs> I'm sure once it reaches like a certain size, it will transition from shrub to tree. Well, I'm sure there's <laughs> different species out there. There's probably one that people plant and have in their yards. And that's probably not really a. But I think shrub. even those species start as shrubs. I think oh, that okay. it really is just like a colloquial kind of name to give a small tree sure but not all shrubs will turn into trees necessarily mm -hmm. um I mean I, that like not all plants can get that big but yeah. mesquite can get huge if you let them right <laughs> yeah they make these big and then there's sub shrubs that's a whole nother group <laughs> <laughs> tiny shrubs um so I I'm really interested in the um your methodology for your work that you're doing out there in the drylands you you were using some kind of contraption to block water yeah so those are called rain out shelters oh, okay and they look like little houses and there is a photo of that in both that video i sent you and also on my website um on my publications page there should be an image of that okay we'll the, see i'll see if you can pull it up those are those are awesome so my advisor um osvaldo sala helped help devise these mechanisms to exclude rainfall and so the the thing on the right you see it looks kind of like a lean-to that excludes uh 80 percent of the incoming rain so that hmm. creates like an extreme drought scenario for this system okay and then the water that's collected that white gutter mm -hmm. and it pools into a tank and inside the tank is an automatic pumping system that will simultaneously pump that water into an irrigation plot. Mm -hmm. So during any rainfall event, we create a simultaneous extreme drought and an extreme rain event. And okay. these two extremes are based on long-term rainfall records uh, to show what a given extreme scenario could be like. Yeah. These systems are sweet because... If you wanted to measure drought, you usually have to wait a long time. So you were saying earlier that we have, we're right now in a series of consecutive drought years, but usually you have to wait like a couple decades to really get many years of drought data to see the effects on plants. Oh. But this is a way to like fast forward and artificially create a drought. I got you. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of thinking we were already in an extreme environment situation with amount of drought, but I guess I, we we get rains decently it does it rain out more out here it rains about the same amount a okay. little less i believe the sonoran desert receives maybe 100 millimeters more but oh, okay they're in the same range both both deserts are classified as semi-arid oh, okay so not the driest but not the wettest okay so uh so that your little structure it kind of looks like is just a bunch of strings or is that plastic that's plastic oh okay <laughs> yeah so those are acrylic past plastic um okay. they're like super long and shaped like a v so when it rains the water kind of funnels down the v like you would see on a gutter in a house oh okay yeah okay and yeah. some water can get through there's like little spaces in between oh, okay. i see that now okay i was like doesn't it looks like string. I don't know how that's blocking 80%, but now I, I can see the plastic. Yeah, okay. I should have brought one. I think I have some oh, some laying okay. around. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, are, is it, are there cattle out there in that range? In this one, yeah. So this area where we do research mm -hmm. is an active rangeland. Um, right now, a lot of the cattle serve a research purpose so we look at the uh, i don't and my lab doesn't but other people who work in this area look at the effects of grazing and drought um oh, grazing okay. and just like grazing intensity sure. that's a really interesting question people are curious to know a lot of ranchers want to know how much cattle can i put on my land without ruining like yeah. next year's yield right yeah so there are cattle out there um around my experiment specifically there are no cattle they'll totally destroy this setup they like to scratch and they'll tromp over everything one year actually we had a site like this in colorado and the <laughs> place where 
we put all these things. We had 40 of them. And the fence got breached and all these cattle had a field day mm. and trampled everything. And it was a huge mess. Oh, and we no. had to rebuild it. It was so sad. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't get any rain during that time. Right. I mean, <laughs> we may have. Oh, no. <laughs> it's one of those, like, you have to definitely put that as a caveat in your paper. Right. That we had a cow incident. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then it was followed by a hail incident. We oh, had like geez. a huge oh, hail storm. Oh, no. Yeah nature was just messing with you that time yeah <laughs> okay it's tough to be a field ecologist yeah i bet i i was wondering about that i was like are you do you stay in buildings out there or are you like camping it and roughing it what <laughs> yeah oh. we stay in in trailers so oh okay not quite camping we have water and a nice well a kitchen <laughs> not sure i would call it nice but we do have a kitchen um, I think the sense of community is really nice, though. You know, you have a bunch of researchers mm -hmm. out there sharing beers around a fire, oh, that's nice. sharing ideas. How many people are out there usually? This year is a little unique because of the pandemic. So there aren't very many. There's oh. um, a few of us from my lab, so about four of us. Okay. And then two others from another university. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. then some cowboys. So I, I love my field site, actually, because it's introduced me to a world I don't think I normally would have seen or like interacted with. And that's like hardcore cowboys and ranchers and people interested in land management. I do what I would say basic scientists, science. I'm interested in like the theory, hypotheses, understanding the system, how does it work? Uh, but these people study cow breeds. How can we get like an efficient cow that is drought tolerant? They're interested in drought tolerant cow <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool and yeah. i'm like wow i never would have interacted with like real cowboys <laughs> and it's pretty fun and and yeah. it's great to see a new perspective of how they view the landscape and what they what they get from it yeah i bet they they understand the landscape a lot more than like most people you know living in the city totally i bet they have some interesting perspectives on all of it because they're out there every day exactly that's pretty cool. Um, how long are you out there for, usually, at a given time? Oh, usually the whole summer. So May through, like, October. So I'll actually be, I'll be jetting out there this week. Um, this is the time when the plants are the happiest. So we go measure them. We me measure how much they grew <laughs> over the year. Um, measure right. how green they got. <laughs> yeah, like a like a measuring stick like okay how tall is he this yeah, year <laughs> yeah pretty much yep exactly like we measure the volumes and um identify everything it's my favorite part it's like when you identify who's there sometimes you see new species and i feel incredibly connected to the work i do this time of year in particular yeah. well I, i'm sure it's a lot greener too and it's not so barren i guess exactly <laughs> yeah well, yeah it's there's some pretty cool flowers that come out too and it's oh, delightful yeah. <laughs> i bet it, uh, do you get like a lot of like uh, wildflower beds growing it's depending on the year yeah so do you remember the super bloom year where <sighs> california was getting poppy blooms and like everyone's social media was blowing up with these beautiful sweeping like orange blankets. We got one like that too at the what? Hornada and I felt super lucky. <laughs> it's like, oh, like no one's out here taking Instagram photos. It's like all to ourselves kind of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> little, little garden. Yeah. I'm sure not a lot of people get to see that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That bloom actually happens earlier though. So kind of back to this temporal niche is um, oh, okay. that particular species bloomed a lot earlier. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, it's um and there some plants uh you were kinda saying like during certain times of year they'll grow. So like some won't grow during the monsoon season but they'll grow during the winter or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, something so an important facet of my research is Okay, we know some plants grow during certain times of the year. Um, I'm really interested in what happens when you change the amount of rain that they receive. Does that alter when they grow? Uh -huh. Yeah. And so when I take photos of these plants every day, what I'm really looking for is are they shifting like when they start to put out leaves or their flowers? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what I'm finding is that shrubs are those big leafy ones with deep roots are pretty insensitive to extreme drought or extreme rain. They'll grow the same, same time, same intensity. The grasses really uh, are quite flexible and sensitive to the amount of water they receive. Oh. So under drought, they'll, they'll shorten when they grow. They'll die a lot sooner. They have a much shorter growing season length. Um, when they get more water, they lengthen it. So the amount, and I know it sounds really intuitive, um, but sure. that has consequences for how much like above ground biomass, we call it biomass, like how much leaves and carbon and stuff they build. Okay. That has consequences for how much biomass they make. And so if we were to be experiencing many more drought years, we're going to have less grasses, less carbon fixation, uh, potential consequences for the atmospheric carbon issue. Yeah. You, uh, you want to explain the carbon fixation or however you called it? Totally. So that's just another way to say photosynthesis. Okay. So plants uh, take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they'll make sugars out of it mm -hmm. using water and energy from sunlight. Okay. And, and so the more plants you have and the more leaves, yeah. the more carbon they can take from the atmosphere okay, and yeah. offset things like our emissions. I got you. Yeah. They, some people call them carbon sinks or something. Totally. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dry lands because, you know, they don't have as many plants as, mm -hmm. as things like forests or tropical forests, but because dry lands cover so much land mass, they are a pretty significant carbon sink. Okay. So it's like having a lot of the little guys still matters. Yeah, I think if I, that makes sense. I read somewhere that like the Great Plains is actually just as much of a carbon sink or s stores just as much carbon as like the r Amazon rainforest. Right. And I, people kind of dismiss the grasses and everything, but they, they store a lot and they got these ginormous root systems don't they right yeah and they put a lot of it below ground um because it's so important for them to try to get water that they'll build they'll build roots they'll they'll store it for next year you're totally right these systems can be pretty important carbon sinks that are overlooked which is why i'm pretty stoked about them <laughs> like <laughs> hey i mean don't get me wrong the rainforest is so important and it's beautiful and I really don't want to like knock other people's research because I want to save the whole planet, sure. but I think dry lands um, really deserve more attention than they receive. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So are you finding that with more drought, uh, so you're, you're finding that with more drought, plants aren't growing as much and they're not absorbing as much carbon, correct? Yeah. Exactly. The grasses. Okay. What's interesting is that the shrubs seem to like the drought quite a lot. Oh. Um, so they don't shift when they grow or anything. And But what's interesting is that they thrive under drought conditions. And we think that's because of the lack of competition for water by grass. So they'll mm. build more biomass under drought conditions. And this has been an interesting kind of topic among my friends and lab group is... You know, if, if your question is an interest is just how much carbon you're fixing, the end result sort of seems the same. Oh, okay. You know, shrubs are thriving under these drought conditions. They'll be fixing as much carbon as the initial scenario. But if your question is, I want a landscape that doesn't erode, is good for cattle to munch on, is habitat for other animals that we're interested in conserving, these shrubs may not be great. And so you really have to look at the entire landscape and multiple science sustainability questions to see, you know, if the outcome you're getting from this um, climate change is, is, is exactly negative great. or, yeah. Yeah, because having too much of the mesquite or a certain type of plant isn't always great. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Like maybe you're still fixing a lot of carbon, but you're creating an eroded landscape that's really poor for growing crops or something yeah um and because grass is really great at holding the soil right yes yeah okay exactly yeah it um you know you don't when you hear dry land you don't really think that there's going to be that much plants but it sounds like there's quite a bit do you know how many plants are out there or at least in your area oh i don't know how many species that's a great question 
I'm not even going to take a stab because I'd probably be lying if I guessed. <laughs> okay. Uh, are, do you ever look at like the impacts on animals or are you just mainly focusing on the plants? I just focus on the plant soil interaction. Okay. Um, there are lots of people who study desert animals as well. Okay. And that's a, a sweet topic. And I can definitely give you some names of friends who study okay. <laughs> really badass desert animals like Gila monsters or snakes and rats and stuff like that. But I still haven't seen a Gila monster. Oh, man. They're incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, so when you're... Uh, we got a needy cat that requires attention. <laughs> um, so when you're uh, taking data, you're measuring like the, le the amount of growth on a plant. You're, is it maybe like the leaf size or... I think in your uh, science article, you were talking about the uh, vibrancy of the green color. Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm looking at just this, um, the cycle of growth question. So in the video you saw, again, I'm, I'm curious, like when are plants growing and when do they die? And is that timeline like shifting? Mm -hmm. The thing I'm measuring is uh, greenness of the leaf. Okay. And that's directly related to how much that plant can photosynthesize. Okay. So like photosynthetic capacity is an important index just for understanding how much carbon it can fix, for okay. example. So we literally just take the pixels from that image and look at how many green pixels there are compared to the rest of the colors. Oh, wait. Okay. So you're, you use, you, you take a picture. Mm -hmm. Oh. And then like I use a, I use a program okay. to kind of draw an area around the plants I'm interested in. And it pulls out all the color information, just like you would get RBG information from any image. Oh. And it's, it's not perfect. Um, sure. I did talk to a photographer, like a real photographer, who was like, I mean, the light would change your color. Like, how can you get an accurate oh, yeah. color representation? Um, so we go through a series of ways to correct it and get rid of outliers. But it's a pretty good estimate if you were to buy, like, these are just cameras, uh, kind of like wildlife cams that you can buy mm -hmm. online from, I don't know, like Moultrie is <laughs> a common, yeah, <laughs> Moultrie is a common brand. Uh, okay. Yeah. There's okay. really fancy ways to do this too. So oh. I mentioned that you can do this from space and NASA has attached to all, a lot of their satellites, super fancy equipment to measure, uh, different vegetation indices. Mm. So they don't do like, they don't really do the green green color thing. Mm -hmm. They actually measure like how much infrared radiation is that plant giving off or it's oh. a lot more rigorous. <laughs> okay. Huh. I I didn't know that. I thought um I feel like I've seen where they've taken pictures of like um an area to kind of show like the changes in le um like during the summer things to start to get drier and hot uh things start to turn brown and then like it kind of like your time lapse but I guess from a space perspective I, thought, I feel like I've seen that before but um infrared light you said yeah near near infrared radiation Ooh, what is that so the sun uh emits well all of space in the sun emits different forms of radiation okay. that earth receives mm -hmm. so things like you know microwaves, radio waves, um, x-rays, UV light, we're particularly interested in as like people to not get sunburned, right? So plants harvest this light energy to photosynthesize and they use light in the visible spectrum. So green light is reflected by plants. Plants absorb a lot of you know, blues and red. Okay. Yeah. Plants also reflect heavily. They do not absorb, um, near infrared. So like the next wavelength after the visible spectrum is infrared mm -hmm. and plants don't absorb any of that. They reflect it all pretty much. So because they reflect it all, it's a really good measurement for how much plant area there is. Oh. Yeah. So we kind of like scientists take how much near infrared is getting reflected because plants are like the only things that fully reflect it. Mm -hmm. uh, so scientists will take how much of this near infrared radiation and relate it to like leaf area 
and stuff like that. I never would have thought of that. It's <laughs> super clever. I think that like one of the things I love about science is seeing all these really creative and clever methods people derive. Right. Yeah. That's I, one of them. I'm like, wow. I, I, you always hear about like what people are like studying and how they're capturing the data. I'm like, how did you even come up with that? Like I never <laughs> would have thought that. That's why I'm not a scientist. <laughs> So, um, were you developmental in creating, uh, were you part of developing this, uh, research study that you're doing or, or did you kind of just join in with one of the professors at ASU? I kind of just joined in. Oh, okay. Um, I was, had just started working in terrestrial systems. I was working in lakes before and I was just working as a technician and my boss, Osvaldo Sala at Arizona State was like, you're super bright. Do you want to work on a project? Like I have one. He really just wanted somebody to help kind of pick up a project. Sure. And I was like, of course, I need to learn new new things. I like to learn. So it sort of fell into my lap, um, which was really lucky. And the more I got to understand it, I loved it and really took it and ran. So this is one of, one of my dissertation chapters now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um. Yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. It's well, so for I was looking at your website, and you have uh, like a little notebook drawing thing. Do you have like a little notebook that you draw sketches and make notes on? Like, is that a thing that you do? Yes, totally. I should have brought that. Um, oh. I have several, uh, so. I love to draw and I've always been artistic. And the, the cool thing about working with, with the natural world is to really understand it, drawing the things you research helps a lot. Really? So especially people, so like the early botanists and naturalists drew everything. We didn't have photos, right? Yeah, I was getting like hardcore Charles Darwin. Expeditions would bring artists on board to record everything. And it really is the best way to learn. Like if you're looking at a plant, um, you have to draw every little part. You're like, okay, this flower has like five petals and it's this color and there's little hairs coming out at the connections where the leaf and stem meet. And these are all characteristics that can help you identify it. These are all really good. Thank you. And so I think drawing helps me observe and understand the things I study in a different way. And that's a pretty important part of doing science is observing the world and the, mm -hmm. the landscape. And that can lead to questions or curious things. Maybe you look at a plant and you're like, oh, that's so weird. Why would this be this way? Why would it be this color? And that's a scientific question right, that you yeah. could go test. Uh, are you interested in I, is it called botany? Yeah, I just started finally taking real botany classes. Nice. I, you know, ecologists, um, I felt that like I was really looking at the plants and animals as like bags of carbon running around the landscape. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I wish I could like identify these. <laughs> so I started to take some botany classes to really learn what they were. And it's so cool, especially grasses. I took a, an awesome class. If anyone is listening, is a student at Arizona State, you should absolutely take Grasses of Arizona. It That's was, a class? It was so cool. Yeah. Grasses are crazy, and I learned a lot about how to identify them. And this is just all about plants? or all Only about grass. grasses. Yeah. I was like, this is so bonkers. <laughs> like, grasses develop crazy seeds, crazy like fruits and flowers. Like The way that they reproduce is nuts. <laughs> There's a lot packed into grasses that Well yeah, are um are grasses are they all usually like all one system? Are they those kind of weird organisms? They, they can be, not all though. Oh, okay. So some that would be um the scientific term is rhizo rhiz rhizotomous. Rhiz some weird long word. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> some plants do that where they'll like sprout multiple from their rooting system, like bamboos like that. Mm -hmm. Um not all grasses do that. Okay. Okay. Grasses are wild. Not all grasses even photosynthesize the same. And that's one of the coolest things I've learned. 
Yeah, and there's usually like multiple species kind of like in one area. Mm-hmm. And they, but they all look the same. <laughs> but they don't. Look at them under a microscope. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I really like your artwork. I uh, Thank you. I, I feel like we've kind of lost that for a little bit where, like, as you said, like, people back in the day would draw and like make observations of the world and i i feel like or i don't really see that very often yeah you know you're right this this combination of of art making and science um was so integrated in in human history and Mm -hmm. became separated at some point i don't know when probably because of the camera the camera and I think like we really maybe in the 20th century started to emphasize STEM, which STEM is really important. But like for some reason, the the arts and humanities kind of got separated from STEM and oh, okay. put in a separate category. And it's unfortunate because I think there's a lot to learn between those fields. Why is that? I think that doing art and doing science is sort of the same process. Oh, really? I think that the scientific method, I I would argue, is quite similar to the process of making art. Hmm. I think that you have um, some sort of, starts with some kind of observation about the world. Okay. Um, It leads to some kind of question. It leads to some kind of thought about the question and exploration of that question and then putting it into like a physical product that can be shared and right. I think art tackles a lot of questions as well that requires that thought process. Yeah, I think art's kind of gone in the society direction. But um, I like the idea of using it in science. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it can help scientists. If, if more scientists um, engage in the arts, I think it could help cultivate virtues that could, like, further enhance the science so virtues like curiosity or humility Mm. like being willing to be wrong or open to new ideas um wonder like it could unlock different perceptions of the world Mm -hmm. that's a really critical part of science is perceiving and observing things yeah i think by engaging in artistic processes this can help scientists see the places and things they study in a different way. Yeah. I have a colleague at my undergraduate institution, um, Dom Challoner, who's really interested in exploring this idea of how art and science can cultivate these virtues. Hmm. It's a really beautiful concept, I think. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I guess I never would have thought about that. I guess there's kind of like this idea that scientists are kind of just data and facts and mm-hmm. like they really don't go beyond that but I think science is sort of a biased process even though it's meant to be objective sure. the second we decide how to do something it's still a little bit biased mm. so there's so many methods and ways to approach problems and questions that those choices we make still inserts the personal aspect of the scientist in them and by like it is important to remain objectivity as a scientist because that creates trust in the public that, you know, you weren't biased or had ulterior motives, but we're still emotional beings that connect to the places we work in. I mean, that motivates me to work in deserts is I love my planet and I, I hate to see it abused and destroyed. And I do have a personal motivation to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not just a robot collecting (laughs) data and, I really care. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to do this process in the most objective way possible. Mm-hmm. But I think connecting with art helps keep that, that like passion and empathy alive. And art can be a really important tool for creating more empathy to help heal the earth. Yeah. Well, I feel like it allows um, not just like the observers or, you know, people reading the studies, but for the scientists themselves to really connect with their work mm-hmm. and not to just as you said, see it as carbon beings wandering around (laughs) the world, but like actual animals. And like, this is, you know, I live here. This is some, my environment kind of thing. And maybe it will allow them to kind of connect to it a little bit more. And so 
I guess there's kind of like this um, uh, way, or at least this perception that scientists kind of have to like take a step back from what they're researching and but maybe that's not really the answer, especially when it comes to uh, climate scientists, climate science and understanding our natural environment. Yeah, I think a problem we have is how do you get somebody to care when maybe they aren't a part of that ecosystem? So you and I live in the desert. We care about it because we live here. But how do you how do you really uh, motivate somebody halfway around the world, maybe living at, like near a swamp to care for this like collective action to better the entire planet you know if I were living somewhere else I could have this perspective of like why should I care about a place that like I'm not directly benefiting from but I think what people forget is that the earth is intricately linked globally through things like carbon and through things like nitrogen these elemental cycles are very much connect places halfway around the world yeah so art can be a form to help bring and transport people to those places that maybe they wouldn't normally experience or live in. Yeah. I wrote a piece um, for a class I took called The Phoenix Transect, and this was led by Mark Klett, a photographer at, at ASU. And my, my, piece, my piece focused on this exactly, like trying to present my work as a scientist, but like as a human being. Like I really tried to present sort of through photojournalism, mm -hmm. how how I, doing science like can be quite personal because I really want to help people connect to where I work. Yeah. Uh, Kale, so it's not this one. Um, if you go to her website. Yeah, it's... And then, yeah, hit enter... Art, art, and then under features. There it is. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep, right there, the Phoenix Transect. If you were to click on that, this is a sweet website to explore. Mm. There's lots of interesting projects that are all connected by the concept that like we all live in Phoenix. So mine in particular was to really try to show the process and struggles and loves of doing science mm -hmm. and like try to keep in those emotions. I don't know if I really succeeded. A lot of the feedback I got was that it was still very rigid. Oh no. <laughs> and that's something that's something I struggle with is like I can paint pretty pictures of the landscape and try to get you to think it's beautiful. But I think when it comes to my personal connection to it and motivation, I still felt that blockage of like, yeah, I am a scientist with no um, feelings. You know, <laughs> like I need to be objective yeah. and like not insert anything else into this. So it's hard. And I want to, I think I want to keep going with this project um, to yeah. bring it in a little more, but I think these facets of doing research don't make it into the super dry publications and you know, the mistakes, yeah. this funny swimming pool that exists at our field site, like all this stuff you don't really see. <laughs> behind the picture yeah or yeah be I, or behind the research I should say I'll be honest I didn't read all of it but I did uh read the little couple paragraphs that you had on your website and I really like that I uh I I do kind of feel like that's it's really important to start going in that direction especially now with how climate change is impacting us because it's not like Climate change is just, um, you know, it's affecting this one rainforest, the Amazon rainforest. Like, not a lot of people live there. Why do they care? It's more of, it's affecting everybody anywhere across the whole world. And so there's a kind of emotional aspect of that that people don't quite realize, I think. And mm -hmm. um, so I feel like if we bring more, like, the emotional side of doing the, the research, it really could help people connect to the research and the studies and the information out there. Absolutely. I think we need to create more empathy for the world and for other people who live there. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have a collective interest for our neighbors. Right. Um, and that's my goal. 
by starting to do more art science. Um, I really hope to help create that, especially for deserts, since people don't think about them all the time. I, I'm sorry. I'm wondering, is that a red chili pepper? Yeah. <laughs> so in Las Cruces, New Mexico, entering Las Cruces, the world's largest chili pepper is sitting right outside of the Red Chili Inn or Big Chili Inn. Is that where you got your earrings? No, I found these <laughs> at a thrift store. I was going to say that'd be perfect. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Huh. I love being in that community. It's super quirky. Yeah. Well, are you, um, you're spending quite a bit of, well, it's, no, you said a few months and at yeah, your field mm -hmm. site. Okay. But I mean, that's a really long time to stay in one area. Like, you, I feel like you got to start calling it home for a part of it. Definitely. It's totally my second home. That's pretty nice. How long, how long have you been working on this? I've been working at this uh, field site. So we call it the Hornada. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? It means passage. So it's part of this um, historic a cattle route called the Hornada del Muerto. Mm -hmm. And it was called the Passage of Death. Oh, it was a really, <laughs> it was a very tough, um, apparently cattle route through a wide open stretch of barren desert. And okay. I've been going to the Hornada <laughs> for about five years now. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, geez, that's, that's a long time. I, I would be very surprised if you didn't grow connected to that land. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you've also been using your artwork for um, to represent the data that you've been collecting. Yeah. Um, Kayla, if you want to pull up the Sci Art Magazine one, it was the first one you pulled up. And that has some pictures. And maybe you can explain some of that because I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. This kind of born out of many conversations with friends. Mm -hmm. And a friend and, and fellow scientist, um, Peter Marting, he studies ants, <laughs> was also interested <laughs> in this topic of the nexus of like art and science. And Peter led a class. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Peter led a class uh, that was all about like converting numbers like real data from your original research into artwork mm -hmm. so the idea is like are there other ways to visualize data that isn't a graph i think graphs and tables you know you have different audiences if you're creating graphs and tables um people might know how to read them like other scientists but if i wanted to show my mom or somebody who maybe isn't in the scientific field mm -hmm. i would love to start putting my real data into pictures yeah and this is a little bit different than just science communication through like pretty graphics and stuff. This is like, can we do paint by numbers using my numbers from those plants? <laughs> and that was the goal of this project. Um, Peter led a class where a bunch of us scientists got together and converted our artwork into, or our data into artwork. Nice. And the result of mine was uh, this phenology project or the, the cycles of plant growth. You know, grasses die when you have drought because they mm -hmm. shorten their growing season length. I converted that into a painting. Okay. It, and it, that's uh, this image right okay. here. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So each panel mm -hmm. represents a different treatment. Um, we have a, a drought treatment, just like an ambient regular treatment, and then an irrigated. So in that picture you saw with the, the contraptions and stuff. Okay. Those are the different treatments. And maybe if you go to the next one, that can help show. There we go. On the back of each, in each panel, the like leaves and stuff are directly proportional to the amount of each kind of plant that was there. So these like super broad leafy ones are the honey mesquite. Okay. And then like the stringy spaghetti looking ones are the grasses. And then we have some rare, rare things like flowering plants and yeah. pretty herbs. And so under drought conditions, you'll see there's a lot more of those mesquite leaves in the painting compared to um, grasses. And then in the irrigation treatments, there's a lot more grasses. Okay. Now the green things on top, those like strips of plastic, uh, those represent the amount of time that the plants are green. Okay. So if it's clear, the plants are dead. If it's green, the plants are alive. And on the bottom portion, 
of each like strip are the shrubs. So it's like green the whole time. Shrubs don't really alter their growing season length or anything. I gotcha. But the amount of greenness for grasses will start to change depending on the rainfall treatment. And that's the top portion of each plastic strip. Nice. Yeah. So how did you come up with this? Like, I spent a lot of time talking to and other artists. I had a, an awesome painting professor at the time. I take a lot of art classes when I can. So I had a painting professor who helped give me the idea for the painting of like, what if the area of leaves you painted was proportional to the biomass? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I was just describing my problem and my question like I am to you and kind of bouncing around ideas with yeah. a lot of different people. I would say this is quite collaborative. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Okay, so let's see here. So you you had different plants painted on there. And like, so the bottom one, it looks like there's a lot more grass. Right. Okay. So that's the irrigation. Okay. The like super wet conditions. I gotcha. Yeah, grass likes water. Mm -hmm. And then the middle one is... Is that the control? Yep. Okay. That is the control. So there's kind of an equal mixture of grass and shrub and uh, herbaceous flowering plants. Mm -hmm. And then the top one's the um, shrubs. Or, sorry, the drought. Yeah, and it's dominated by shrubs. Okay, there we go. That was close. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I really like that. Um, are, you, are you incorporating this into your... Uh, your is it called a thesis? Yeah, in a way. Um, I'm not sure how I'll incorporate artwork into the actual dissertation. Oh, okay, I've been creating concept art and like abstract art forms to try to like to try to display concepts, and I put those in my presentations. I'm pretty sure I will work out a way with my advisor to put them in the actual document. Oh, yeah. I don't know how yet. Or maybe I can find a way to do some kind of exhibition at the end. I want to create one for for each chapter. So I have four different research projects, and this is just okay. one. Oh, okay. So I did have this thought, like, how cool would that be to, you know, when you defend your dissertation, you stand up and you give a talk, and it's numbers and graphs and people listen but I thought how cool it would be to bring artwork to that talk or display them somewhere yeah you know, present the the art side and the art forms in addition to the to the graphs and the yeah and the data I, that, I think that'd be really cool I feel this, like this, sorry go ahead this painting I actually took to a conference um nice this was a, a purely scientific conference and I was like let's stir it up a little bit and <laughs> bring a painting instead of a poster. Yeah. Normally you have a big hall filled with posters and on the poster, it's sort of like um, my sister did a great job of summing it up, an adult science fair. <laughs> so, you know, when little yeah. kids do like trifolds and they have stuff on the trifolds, yeah. same thing, just with beer and wine oh. and- <laughs> There's alcohol involved. Totally, <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's, it's great because people really, this is where the cool like casual conversations occur. I gotcha. So I was like, I'm going to bring my painting and see what people think. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable, you know, a lot of people were very intrigued. They were so excited to see art and they were like, we need to do this more. Let's like fuse the fields, just like the conversation we had. Yeah. Other people really couldn't give, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but Go for it. couldn't <laughs> give a shit about <laughs> the fact that it was a painting, but they were like, how interesting that drought really affects the grass phenology. <laughs> like they still looked at it as if it were data. Yeah. And I was so pumped by that that yeah. I was really excited that it could still be interpreted and perceived as a um, piece of data. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was really successful that it started to create conversations. So now uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in this field and a small group of us are putting together an art exhibit nice. for next year's conference. We want, we want a lot of people to bring their artwork. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have a name for it yet? Not yet. Okay. I was going to say. You have to get it approved first. (laughs) We'll look out for that, everybody. That'll be cool to go We'll take suggestions for sure if it's approved. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I, I really, I really like what you're going here with this because I think one of my issues is I, I never went to a master's or a PhD. I'm strictly just a bachelor's degree. And although I, I learned a lot, there's, I'm still kind of limited on like my ability to like read research papers or studies and stuff like that. And so like even myself, who's gone to college, like I have a hard time understanding what people are trying to convey when, with their studies. And if, people did this I feel like it'd be so much easier to understand what they're what they found out what they're trying to present and everything yeah I think that's an excellent point and a lot of artists are doing this okay um I think people are starting to pick up momentum and realize that art can achieve that that goal of communication better than a purely scientific product can yeah um I have a a great friend, Carla Moeller, put together a really cool talk for this conference. And the entire concept was that facts don't change minds. And it's unfortunate, but it's true. Like, just kind of telling people a fact, like, climate change is is happening because of an acceleration of the amount of carbon dioxide. And that's due to human... Like, people just don't listen. They zone out. They zone out. They deny it. They don't want to hear... They don't want to hear it. It's it's hard. It's kind of a tough tough thing to swallow. But portraying these this information through imagery um, can kind of get people to understand it in a different way. Right. So there's all sorts of examples. I can I can send you some over email or something okay. where artists have created really beautiful Im- imagery and visuals to convey these same messages that are far more effective at changing minds. Yeah. I- I feel like we really need stuff like that, especially now where we're kind of like at a crossroads. Like either we could go this way if people started acting accordingly or we're going to go down this path and it might not be so great. So I, getting more people on board, yeah, I think is really important, especially now. Yeah. And I think if you see something, it's easier to digest than giving numbers like we were talking about rainfall amount and you're like what even is 240 (laughs) millimeters if I were to like show you a cup of water or something and Mm -hmm. be like this is how much the Chihuahuan desert receives it's a little easier to see I think and there are a lot of artists just this one glass yeah (laughs) there's there's a lot of artists that are doing that pretty well yeah yeah I I definitely agree I think um it would also allow science to reach more people Definitely. it doesn't it will allow people to feel like they can still be involved in science without being scientists or have gone to college so absolutely you know if we start having art that was about the impacts of climate change you know i feel like that would really sway some people or something like that definitely i think it's a really important to also point out that indigenous and native communities have been recording and keeping careful records of of climate and landscapes for a very long time in forms that aren't like western methods in science and so they may also be we should really talk to those groups and communities and learn traditional ecological knowledge that isn't always in the form of numbers. Yeah. So I saw some beautiful examples of like harvest, annual harvest of certain crops that was woven into different baskets and it was data Um, and it was different information just displayed through art forms that is just as effective. Yeah. I I never would have thought about that. Yeah. It's, um, I feel like scientists have a hard time gathering the historical data especially when it comes to climate so who knew it was on we basket. should talk to art historians oh i don't mean to digress completely oh, but it. this was like one of the coolest things i learned in my grass class was um <laughs> we figured out like the domestication of wheat and can get long-term wheat uh records of like wheat yields and crop yields 
through artwork. So the ancient Egyptians created pretty proportional imagery. So their human figures and hieroglyphics mm -hmm. were directly proportional to like, they, they were scaled correctly. Yeah. So like the human figure in the image to the wheat figure was perfectly scaled to like real life people and wheat crops. Nice. That That's like another early data collection that right. art historians were able to help scientists uh, convert yeah. into a record. Yeah, because weeds never hasn't always looked like it does. It's it's changed over time, just like corn. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you you would you wouldn't think about that. A lot of people kind of look at it. It's like, oh, it's art. They just there's information in it. Yeah, All, like usually, especially in those early ancient arts, there's tends to be a lot of information. The transfer of knowledge wasn't always written. Right. Well, yeah, I guess, I mean, that's true with almost every civilization. Like, what we paint is usually, or, yeah, what we paint or draw is important to us. And, like, it can kind of show either the perspective or what's going on in the world at that time. Yeah, the fashion, the culture, the yeah. the foods, yeah. Mm -hmm. huh, that's cool. Yeah. I like that a lot. Let's re refuse art and science. <laughs> I, I definitely think it's, it's needed, and hopefully... Uh, you can keep pushing that and art will start to become more prevalent and uh, science and maybe it'll push the way forward into a better future. Yeah. All right. Support your local artists. I think that's one way we can begin to do this is mm -hmm. to support artists and the arts and these things that are quite underfunded right now. So, I mean, I think climate science is like it's hard to get funding and explain it. There's a lot of climate denial, but the arts really have it hard. So oh, support yeah. your artists. <laughs> right. Yeah. We've, uh, we've actually gone to like the Mesa downtown, like art walk that they've done. And like, nice. it, for a little, like the first year we went, like it was pretty, um, busy. Like there was quite a bit of artists, but like a couple months later, or, you know, the next year, like there wasn't as many as more like, who's advertising stuff and we're like we want to see the artists and like they're disappearing and yeah um so it's art is a lot more important than we really think and it can tell a story and i i like that a lot all right um is there anything that i missed that you'd like to talk about i think we covered everything yeah i just would like to say thank you again this oh is, yeah <laughs> this was awesome and i'm excited to have been a part of a podcast it's my first one and i'm quite honored so thank you <laughs> <laughs> we're happy to have you on i was really excited to have you here and uh learn about the work you were doing i was looking at it i'm like oh what is this and like oh this is so cool and <laughs> thank you yeah so I, I was really excited to have you on so thank you for coming on you're welcome all right, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>